We are being, we're being handed the uh, difficult task to round off a long afternoon of lots of uh, impressions, talks and information. And we'll do this by presenting a manifesto from which um, we draw from our manifesto that's a uh, across-the-border collaboration between Holland and Belgium. And our main message in here is there is a new era dawning in Europe. Trans transitions are evident in almost all domains of society. Arts institutions and the art support structures need to help to make these transitions happen or more precisely to help steer them into a desirable and positive direction. This requires strong leadership. It requires that artists and arts organizations should broaden their perspective from just audiences to the public sphere. It requires new connections and cross-sectoral collaboration. Let's talk politics. And we'll explain how we do that. Yeah, we have been talking about this uh, earlier today. Uh, Europe is uh, facing a turning point. And when Europe is turning towards more inequality, a rising unemployment, more xenophobia, and a pure economic perspective on social life, not to mention the budget cuts in many sectors, the arts cannot persist in business as usual. When the road is turning, you cannot go straight ahead. In such a hardening society, either the arts will become one of the first victims or end up as the splendid castle of a small elite. Maybe that's a first answer already on why we should embrace transition. It's all about our own survival as a democratic institution. We shouldn't open up because we feel sorry for poor people or less educated school children deprived from arts and culture. Today, it's all about our own reference and our own relevance in society. If the arts want to remain, re if the arts want to remain relevant, arts institutions and arts organizations will need to open up. That is to develop new ways for people to engage and to build new connections across society. And what we want to do is to present two ways of many to do so. The first way is by participatory art practices. We need to rethink our concept and way of approaching the audience. Why? People do not want just to come in and see a play or a performance. They want to be engaged, if not participate, in the production of works of art. In participatory art practices, as we defined in our manifesto, the audiences are at the core of the arts practices. They co-create together with professional artists. So what are these participatory art practices in our opinion? Obviously, they're participatory. People do have an active role. And they're artistic. We're talking about the arts. But they're also contextual. Artists conduct artistic research into social or political issues and engage with an urgency in matters that citizens indicate that they want to get a grip on themselves. But they are also transformative. The intended outcome is positive change for individuals, for groups of people or for the wider community with regard to the issue that served as the point of departure. So the, the essence is, is that the subject of participatory arts practices is a topic that matters to people and society. And their objective is change in existing power relations by uh, emancipating the participants and empowering them. As such, these practices can provide the basis for new perspectives, new approaches and new relations. And if we then look to the reality today, the, the practice in arts, we see very different uh, positions. There are certain parts of the uh, arts sector and arts administration who are very afraid of change and defend artistic autonomy. And when you say to them, 
uh, we have to open up to other groups and art forms, they hear loss of artistic quality or reduction, uh, reduction of, of welfare. I think um, artistic autonomy, if we continue to see this as a holy grail, that's the best way of losing it, this autonomy. I think autonomy for the future is in interdependence. It's being dependent of many. Then you see another group uh, in the art sector where the awareness of this positive uh, contribution of the arts in domains of care, welfare, reintegration in the labor market, social and physical, uh, urban renewal, they, they see this awareness. The problem is that our policies, budgets and structures are not yet adapted. And in the meantime, you see lots of uh, artists, an increasing number of art practitioners who seek out, for instance, deprived urban areas, daycare centers or hospitals as their preferred workspace. They no longer distinguish between autonomous or applied or socially engaged art. So there's a new generation and something different coming. And we heard many examples already this afternoon from the Nordic countries. But the same happens in Belgium, in the Netherlands, and it happens across the board. Meaning high arts institutions, if you want to call them that, uh, have participatory art practices and individual art, arts artists um, as well. For instance, the Amsterdam uh, Opera Theatre made a Wagner opera with people uh, with a criminal record. The Amsterdam Photo Museum has a structural program around intergenerational uh, encounters. In Brussels, there is a theater group for Tizia that, made, um, that makes music theater pieces with refugees, homeless and middle class people. An interesting mix, I think. There is Odin Theater in Denmark, you are probably well familiar with. And there is many more examples that we could mention today. And what these practices um, have in common is their will to contribute to debates in the public sphere in a constructive way. They don't show for the hundredth time the crisis of a middle class family or a Europe in decline. They rather talk about the positive capacity of minorities or connect the dreams of people about their own area. They practice what they preach. And that's very important, I think. They aim for change. And one participatory art practice from Holland we explore more in detail. It's a, it's a practice that's uh, started by several city or regional art centers in one of the Dutch uh, provinces. And individually, they all started developing programs for people with mental or physical disability, uh, programs for people with a distance to the labor market, as uh, they call it in the Netherlands, to get empowered and to find their own passion and their voice and therefore finding a way back into paid work, programs for people uh, within local uh, communities to empower the communities, uh, people with Alzheimer disease, etc., etc. And although they started all individually, nine of them decided to form a strategic alliance also to bring the message across um, that the arts and the social sector can work together really well and can also advance uh, together get this message to, across also to the governmental level, because in practice they didn't experience that much uh, problems collaborating intersectorally. The problem started when they started a conversation with the government about structural uh, funding, about doing this uh, long term. They asked me in to help them building these bridges between the arts and the social sector and the government and they organized roundtable talks. 
And these talks were very instructive. And, and to give you a few examples, um, well, the idea was that the councillors and other policymakers would attend from the two sectors, the social and the arts sector. But oftentimes the councillors didn't come and just send the policymakers. And if they did indeed attend themselves, it was often the first time that they sat down with their colleagues to talk about structural collaboration. And the funny thing was that they all actually agreed about the positive uh, effect the arts can have within the social domain. But as soon as it came down to the question of restructuring funding, that was more or less the end of the conversation. Only if the arts intervention in the social domain served directly the governmental aims and goals were they willing to invest. So this governmental compartmentalization, uh, these various sectors being separated is still very strong. But these roundtables also showed us what is needed, obviously, and then needed from governments, uh, I think, to name only a few, is that governments proactively share their needs, the issues they're dealing with on a daily basis, and the issues where they could use like a fresh outside look uh, or an alternative intervention. What governments need, I think, is to understand themselves as partners by adopting a coordinating role and also helping to get these sectors together to facilitate new developments and intersectoral relations. And they need to trust arts organizations that they can indeed contribute to other domains. But there's also things needed from the arts institutions themselves. First of all, to make visible all the beautiful practices that are already there. To adopt policy goals in their programs if they want to indeed uh, encounter on a long-term collaboration. They need to stay in touch or get in touch with society and thus become demand-oriented. To connect to other domains but to also stay through to, to, true to the arts, to make a concrete investment in their organizations, to free people, to free time up for these collaborative acts. That was the first way, the participatory uh, art practices. Uh, now we go to Belgium uh, for a second way of building new connections across society. Um, and our good practice is a, a civil movement, um, which I happened to start together with some other people two years ago. Um, what I want to tell is that uh, I think it's very important, apart from a temporary uh, project, to connect with other forces and dynamics in society on a higher and a more political level. Just so not just in, uh, yeah, in small projects for like one year, but more structurally and independent from our own season's program and our direct interests. It's uh, very important um, because one of the tragic evolutions of this time is that um, many fields of society, as you all know, are confronted with severe budget cuts but they don't manage to take a stand against these authority, austerity politics together. And why not? We have all become uh, very professional on our own islands. But between these islands, uh, connections, sometimes they, uh, they lack. Um, and there's no better way to support a neoliberal agenda than being divided. Question? Who will be with us on that day? Imagine art subsidies are cancelled completely. That question was the start of Hart Boven Hart. In my best Swedish, uh, I could translate this as Jertan uh, over Hoort. So it's the human uh, above the economical, heart over heart. Yeah. Um, I think. That's quite clear. We started it when we had a new uh, right-wing government in Belgium. There was no plan. 
There was just the need of cultural part partners, youth movement, trade unions, NGOs, the ecological movement, poverty organizations, social work workers, to build one alliance with individu individual civilians. And the first evenings of the movement, um, to share our common perspectives on the new coalition agreement of the government, they were in theater buildings in different cities at the same time. And a whole new energy was filling the space because so many different perspectives uh, were combined with striking similarities and shared needs that no one was aware of. And in two years, Hart Bova Hart has seen the rise of 25 local groups. It was not a plan, they popped up. There is, in this movement, no funding, there's no uh, office. It's just happened because there is a kind of urgency to link all these sectors. And what we have done is uh, protesting against uh, the cuts of the new government or for better working conditions. We have organized four uh, civil conferences about all kinds of uh, political topics. We have been planting trees. We, we made a mobile theater play about the tax fraud of multinationals. We hacked uh, a metro uh, newspaper with our alternatives. We published alternative opening speeches of our prime minister and so on. And in March, uh, that was the picture you saw here, in March 2014 and 15, more than 20,000 people, civilians, were assembling in Brussels to speak out for our 10, we call it hard wishes, um, for another society in a very creative and colorful parade. We are not a new movement, and the most important goal is to connect all expertise, protests, uh, and alternatives that, that are existing. What has this to do with art? The input of artists and art institutions in the field and communication of Hart Bo Boven Hart is crucial. It were um, artists who uh, introduced the idea of using giants in all the activities uh, we do. Um, it's also art people who balance the quite predictable action models of the trade unions uh, to make it uh, into more creative forms. It's an interesting exercise for us all. But the most important uh, for myself is, this is the metro uh, hack, uh, the most interesting to myself is that you feel a very big need in all the other organizations outside of culture for the creative input of uh, artists and art institutions. Um, I think that's important, uh, that it's not about our products, but more about our way of creative thinking and imagination that is, I think, which makes the difference and, and which they uh, need, because everyone is like a little bit stuck in, in the classical forms, not only culture, but also the rest of society, I think. We have one conclusion, and then, <laughs> then we quit. <laughs> Running the risk of preaching to the already converted, we came up with a kind of four-step uh, plan <laughs> for about how to go, from, how to go on from here. And the first step would be choose your mode of protest because there is obviously several options. There are the barricades, revolution, founding a new society. There is also the long march through the institutions. There is the civil movement, also a long march and maybe a way in between these other two. You will have to choose your own way, because obviously going down all roads at the same time won't be an option. Then once you've chosen step two, do a self-check. Is your institutional organizational structure supportive of the values you try to convey? In many institutions, we find a discrepancy between the discourse and the practice. Are you aware, or enough aware, of what is going on in the everyday life reality of your partners, the other parties you would like to work with? Uh, 
Are you aware of the issues they are dealing with and how you can contribute to solving or transforming them? Once you're done with that, step three, ready? Then start building cross-sectoral and intercultural relations. Because if you don't build these new practices together, they will never emerge as new shared practices. And then maybe all the way along, it's not so much a fourth step as a bottom line. Be aware, keep the art alive. Governmental departments and the social sh uh, sector should need to understand what an arts process requires. And the art sector needs to understand that the arts can be a goal, obviously they are a goal, but can also be a means. So bury the holy grail of artistic autonomy and avoid excessive instrumentalization or economization of the arts, for both would be a death knell for arts role in transition. And let us finish by reiterating the bottom line, why would we do it? We're not just doing it for the betterment of society. In essence, we are working on artistic innovation and exciting new art forms. And just one note, let's think about this, these four steps for, for instance, this conference. It would be very interesting, like next year, that we discuss the same questions as we do today, but together with activists, trade union people, uh, the ecological movement, civil society, poverty uh, movements. I think uh, because of it can be, be very interesting for us that that would create uh, a lot of enthusiasm. Um, as you hear, we can talk in hours, but just ask us uh, when, we, when we are around. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.